What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview where every single week I interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate professionals, strip top badass stuff. They're dominating their spaces. They're people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves and their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, you guys, we've got another amazing rock star guest on the show. Our guest today, you guys, is a mindset coach who has coached more than 300 entrepreneurs over the nine, last nine plus years and specializes in working with entrepreneurs that are in post startup and scale phases inside their business and are struggling to get to the next level, which I know is a lot of us that are in the real estate industry that look, we want to go out there and scale and grow our businesses. And, you know, maybe we just aren't sometimes in, in knowing of that exact strategy and what to do. And 90 plus percent of this is up here. So I'm really stoked and honored to have our guest on the show today, Joe Trodden. Welcome to the show. Hi, guy. Great to be here. Thanks for the, the intro. Yeah, man. No, I'm, I'm excited, dude. This is before we hit the record button. You know, I was kind of talking to you about a lot of the, the common issues that I get reached out to from our listeners. And so much of it is, you know, I know what I need to do. You know, it's not the information of the, the tactical stuff, you know, right? And they, they have these big goals, but more boils down to, you know, why am I not doing the things I know I should be doing every day? It's like, I know I should get up at this time. I know I should be doing these things. And they know what they want to create and, and why they want to create it. But again, they're just not taking action and they just get stuck. You get in this rut and it happens, right? Um, but before we get into all the stuff that you're doing today, man, I'm really intrigued on what led you into this path in the first place. Like how, how you know, we run the clocks nine plus years. Like how did you wind up in the coaching space and doing what you're doing today? So I did the um, the traditional thing of, you know, I was reasonably smart at school. So you go to university, ended up in uh, an IT career um, because it was it was a job, right? It was like a well-paying job. There's career option there, or basically on autopilot. But I'd always been interested in people's heads. And I guess there was just a moment, there was a, just an inflection moment of like walking into work the same way I'd walked a thousand times, you know, uh, and I just had a point of, uh, this is not where I'm supposed to be. Like it was a real diamond tip bullet of, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And then from there, it was just a series of pivots in life around doing a psychology degree. I worked with young people for a bit, but I realized that wasn't like the space I wanted to be in. I'm really interested in global change. I thought social enterprise is a good way to do that, set up my own social enterprise. But really it was about the, the macro environment so I got a, a role working with a, an amazing organization called Entrepreneurial Spark, which helps entrepreneurs. And then from there, you know, I've always just been pulled towards my own vision. And you're, probably your listeners are a bit like that as well, that they, they could work for somebody else, right? But you just get pulled. The, the pull is so strong to go and live the, the life that you want to live. So you make that leap. So when you look back on it, it looks, <laughs> it looks very purposeful in reverse. But really, it was, let's do the next thing. Mm, this is right, and this is not right. And uh, it was just been pivots all the way towards where I'm at the moment. And now I'm in a place where I am working with people's heads, um, and I'm working with guys that are doing stuff like and creating impact every day, which is unbelievably exciting for me. So uh, that's basically how I've ended up where I was. It's not entirely by design, but the critical thing was taking action. Take the action, reflect what's right about this, what isn't right. Make the next move, make the next move until you find that niche. What could be a going during, because, you know, it's, you talked about walking into work the thousand times you've done that same walk and, and yeah. realizing that that wasn't what you were, were meant to do on this earth, you know, right? Sure, sure. But then you start taking action and you're, you're going into these other spaces. But what kept pushing you, I guess, to, to, you know, because I'm guessing all that happened over a lot of years, you know, right? And a lot of people sure. at some point, you're just like, well, shit, man, maybe I just not somebody that loves work or, you know, a lot of people at some point just quit. Like what kept you going to, to find that thing that truly pulled you? It's purpose, man. You know, like it, it was when I was doing the IT job, I was doing that to make money to live my life. Like there was this very clear separation. Um, and it's interesting because there's, there's some sort of point in people's lives and for the people I speak to, it tends to happen like early thirties where they reach a crossroads to go, this can't be what my life is supposed to be. And then some people will go, 
yeah, but I can't really do anything about it. And then to live, to live a life of 20 years of misery in some corporate job or whatever. Not that all corporate jobs are miserable, but do you know what I mean? Like you have that point of they want to do something. Um, I have I don't have any, like I'm not married. I don't have any kids or it. So I always have like opportunities to take some risks and not feel there were too many dependents and, you know, set up this business and try that out. But it's always been about um, just being pulled towards that purpose there's always been something that's driving that and don't get me wrong I'm not preaching here like yeah man I was knocking out the park every waking moment because I wasn't there were times where I was in those roles and still not being very purposeful but every time it just seemed to build up and build up to that inflection point of I've got to make another move I've got to make another move but purpose the fact that I'm, I'm here I'm on this earth to do something and to leave an impact um, and that's what's driven all of it, you know? So then, you know, because the, the word purpose or, you know, finding your why, you know, sure. it seems like it's kind of like 50-50, like 50% of people out there, like it clicks and, and it's powerful for them. But then there's the other 50% that I see that it almost like screws them up worse where they're, they self-sabotage themselves because they can't get clarity on their purpose and their why. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, can you kind of talk about, and, and maybe whether this is with your own journey or even with your clients, are you helping get clarity on this? You know, because it's like, hey, like, I think we would all love to be very clear on our purpose, sure. right? Um, but man, that's a tough thing to figure out. Yeah, it's a tough thing. I think what, what can feel overwhelming about that is, um, I don't know, there, there's like, there's, there's a, a a fakeness at times around people that that have that and then um i don't know like it's it, it can feel a little artificial and distant to to um some people i think like my honest answer around that is like i say it was always these little pivots it was like there's something not quite right what is right about the situation and what isn't you know and just making the next move there can be a lot of pressure on this is definitely going to be my big why and this, this huge impact and this purpose that I'm going to create. And then it can feel overwhelming. So you don't take the first step or it can feel like you, the first step is a misstep and then you beat yourself up too much about it. It's really just thinking about what I call milestone one. You know, the big, <coughs> the big why, the big vision, it's the same the entrepreneurs that I work with. There can be like a big pressure on them to go, as soon as you're an entrepreneur, you're supposed to have this mega global hyper company you know, that's this global dominating force. And it's just not the case. Like it might get to that, but what's the furthest thing you can see? Take that as a, a sense of direction. Now that could be three months. Do you know, it could be one month. It's just about going, what's that, what's that one change or that one thing that I want to explore? If people don't know what their why is, then just be a bit curious about it. Be curious and it's okay if you don't get it right the first time. Um, rather than being like overwhelmed and I've got to pick that thing and then, you know, every, every waking moment's got to be driven towards that. Sometimes it's just make the little change, go to a class, open your mind up a little bit. Yeah, it almost sounds like the, you, the purpose today may be to, hey, hopefully find your purpose. Yeah, spot on, man. Do you know, and, and you, people do know themselves. What, what is amazing, I'm not a, a religious person, but there's something going on that is like this bigger force that there's no coincidence that people on earth all have these different interests, right? You know, the people that are totally lit up by whatever that thing is, whether that's being, you know, you know running a bobsled or creating the world's greatest cup of coffee or like whatever that thing is, we've all got those little interests and it is just about exploring them, you know? Um, so yeah, what, what do you love? There's, there's a great thing in Japanese called Ikigai. Uh, and your listeners could like look that up as a tool. And it just prompts you, gets you thinking, asks you some questions. You don't have to find that final, that final answer. You can ask, just answer some of those questions. The ones that are, you're not being asked. You know, nobody's asking you those questions if you're in that corporate job or when I'm in my IT job about what do you really want to be doing? What does the world need? What can you get paid for? you know, like it's just opening yourself up to exploring those things a little bit more. Yep. Love it, man. Love it. Um, then, um, you know, when it, when it comes to, well, it, let me kind of take a step back too, is, 
and just from my own personal, I guess, journey of, of being an entrepreneur now for about 15 years, you know, it, it's, it's, my purpose has changed so many times, right? Sure. Like in the beginning, it was like, I was just sick and tired of being broke. I wanted to work for myself, not somebody else. And I wanted to create more opportunities. I didn't know what those sure. would be, but I just wanted more money. And that drove me for a long time. And then got to the point where, you know, that no longer did it for me. Then it was, you know, build a big business, you know, right? And then it was like now today, 15 years into it, it's like now it's just like, man, I just, I just want to live every day with just excitement, just to, just to love each and every day and each moment with it. And hopefully I impact a few people along the way, you know, right? I mean, it's, sure. it, it's almost like diminished, you know, right? But <laughs> you know, so what would you say to people though? Cause that are different life phases, you know, right? Like when I yeah. got an entrepreneurship, I wasn't married, didn't have kids. And then I did sure. why they changed things. And so we do have to have awareness of some of these shifts. And cause sometimes we think we want something, we arrive there and like, ah, maybe this isn't it. Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. And like those, those shifts, that's why I'm saying about, you know, that big end goal. Life is a series of chapters, you know, and some chapters are about like, let's, let's step back and just take time for myself and, you know, wh whatever it is that, that you want to go and explore. I think that the key thing is just being purposeful, you know, and knowing about that. It's like with my entrepreneurs as well. If they are, there are times where they have to, and you'll experience, you'll have definitely experienced this as well, but there are times where you have to run in the red zone, you know, and like really be close to that burn all the time. But you can't live your entire life in that place because it's not, it doesn't make, you're not more effective living there all the time. You know, the, the perpetual hustle vibe isn't really something that I subscribe to. There are times where you need to turn that dial up, but there are times where you need to pull away from that as well. And just actually think, what is important to me? What is it that I actually want? Like I don't, I own, well, I don't really even consider myself an entrepreneur. I'm not trying to build an enormous company because it, that doesn't give me the buzz. I like to work with loads of different people, um, explore different ways of, you know, the human mind working, understand where I can add that value. So it is that series of chapters, like you said, and it's just about what's important to you at, at each point. The key thing is about asking yourself, like, am I being purposeful? You know, am I, am I the hero of this story at the moment or am I just like, you know, am I cast member B in somebody else's story? That's like the critical thing for me. Yeah, love it. So you mentioned something though earlier about the pull and being pulled, right? And, and there's like this big difference between push and pull, right? It's like mm -hmm. push is kind of the motivation that, you know, pushes you maybe to get started, but that doesn't last. And, and the pull sure. is... Maybe like the deep conviction, you know, right? We're no longer, you need the push, um, you know, but it, it can be tough to identify that pull. And, you know, I think unless we do have that awareness, we're slowing down and paying attention to it, right? It's hard to know if something's pulling you. So what, what kind of advice or recommendation would you give for those to find that pull, right? So it's not just you know, motivational book after motivational book where they're just forcing themselves to grind. And, and you said the hustle mentality, which is what so many entrepreneurs fall into, which is that hardcore push, you know, at least for, for a lot of them, you know, what, what kind of recommendations would you give to, to be able to identify the pull versus the push? So I have to say, look, for, for my guys, it's the having that, that space to really consider some of those questions, you know, like take yourself away, put yourself in a totally like new environment, whatever that is for you. I mean, for me, it's always in, in nature, you know, like take yourself away from everything that's going on. Give yourself actual space to explore it. Just as, as the reflection piece, a tool like Ikigai will help. Something like even as a basic as a, a Myers-Briggs test will help you to understand more about like how you think. So if people aren't familiar with that, it's, it's a personality test. You can take it free online um, at 16personalities.com. But it just introduces you to reflect on your strengths and how you think. Because often we take those things for granted. We can think like, oh, what, what actual, you know, what value do I have? Because we're so focused on our weaknesses and they're so apparent to us that we overlook these natural abilities that we've got, these traits that we can use, that we can double down on. Um, and I, it's a hard one for me because I'm so, I'm so intrinsically motivated by my own, flying my own flag. You know, there's, there's people that want to get behind somebody else's mission and think about how they can contribute to that. And not everybody should be an entrepreneur. 
or like a, a freelancer or work alone because it adds a lot of pressure um, that some people, it's, they're just not, you know, it's, it's not going to be right for them. They won't enjoy it. But it's getting that space. The thing is, man, I believe everybody, if they just take that time and look inside and go and explore and be curious, will find it. If I was to even offer that option between, hey, do you want to go and play a game of sports or do you want to go and do a cookery class? You know, there's probably going to be a, an immediate reaction to one of those, right? So it's just about thinking, what are those options? People, people know what it is that's inside them that they want to do. I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is more about giving yourself permission to explore it and be wrong, to go and take that class. And do you know what? It sucked. But here's what was nice about that. So how do I take that and go and do the next thing? I think it's just taking that permission to take the first step and that you can be wrong about that. Yeah, I was reading this morning and there's a quote in there about something of, you know, before you before you start climbing the mountain, you know, take some time to reflect to make sure that that is the mountain you want to be climbing because you can spend 20 years taking steps to climb the mountain for only a few seconds of a view once you're at the top. Like making sure yeah. it's the right mountain and and it sounds to me like from what you're saying is, is similar to that analogy of exploring those options to make sure that this is truly what you want to do, you know, right? But, but equally going that if you get 15 feet up that mountain and you go, do you know what? This isn't the right mountain to just go and find the next one. Like do take that time out to go up the, what's important to me, but just be, accept the fact that you might actually not be quite right about that. Um, I, I, like I said, I think the key thing for me is people not giving themselves permission to explore uh, and not having the courage to go and do that. And a great way to do that is to just get some accountability. You know, anybody who's in that position, because this is not really my key demographic, but anybody who's in that position, they do, if, if they reflect, they can take that first step. The thing that stops them doing it is, you know, what if I'm wrong or I look stupid or blah, blah, right? But if you just get some, it's, one of your friends feels like that as well. Do you know, somebody in your circle feels the same way. If you have the courage to have that conversation, somebody else will go, do you know what, man? I feel a bit like that as well. And you just hold each other accountable for taking the first step. Not the big life plan. What's the first step you're going to take that week? And the, the accountability will get you over the line. Do you, with your experience with working so much with so many entrepreneurs, because entrepreneurs are just, you know, we, we get so guilty of living this fast pace. You know, it's... Yeah. It's almost like the, the Olympic athlete, like the hardest thing to get them to do is not to train in the gym. It's getting them to rest and recuperate, yeah. you know, right? <laughs> I mean, do you, do you, with your experience with entrepreneurs, I mean, is that hold to be true or they just don't seem to take enough time to, to really reflect it? Cause there also can be very fast, decisive people, but if they're not deciding in a clear, you know, minded state, and really taking time to reflect on that. Like I've, I've made so many terrible decisions where if I just took the time to really reflect on it, the outcome could have been totally different. Sure, man. And it's the, it's that stage of growth. See, this is this, a, this point of change, this transition that I help them through is <clears throat> if you're going to be an entrepreneur, when you start, you've got to be prepared to be punched in the face and like take opportunities, every, any opportunity that comes and make the most of it and move, move fast and pivot and change and do things you wouldn't normally do. And for a lot of people, that's hard, right? So if you're somebody who is a, a, a really detailed, uh, focused, you know, planner, you want to be certain before you do it, don't be a startup entrepreneur because you'll find that it'll just grate against you so bad. But then you get to this point where you can't operate that way anymore. Because now you've got a team, you've got a few people around you, and you've got to start putting a bit of structure around. Because otherwise, you are going to be chasing, your team's not going to know what's going on. You're out there still chasing those opportunities. It's chaotic. So it's about putting down a good strategy framework at that point. So you can use your energy where it actually needs to be used. Because you're wasting it by pursuing these other 25 opportunities, right? So it's about getting focused on that. The whole thing about the rest is that, when you get to that, hey, it's hard enough. See, when you start as an entrepreneur, it's hard getting the first opportunity. Like you could have the cure for broken arms and everybody's got a broken arm and nobody wants to listen to you that you've got the cure for broken arms, right? No, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, it'll, it'll fix itself. But when you actually start to get the, the traction point, the challenge then is saying no to stuff and letting fires actually burn. So your to-do list will never, ever end. 
And the further down that line, at that traction point, every opportunity looks great and everything's hard to let go. So in order to not destroy yourself with the hustle and the burnout, it's knowing what do you have, to, what do you just say no to? And where do you give yourself that extra bit of time for reflection, recuperation, personal development? And that's something that I help with those entrepreneurs with. Because once you're clear on the strategy, you can actually go, why am I doing these five things that you know, are not really helping me to achieve that, that aim? And how am I going to make sure that I recharge? Because if I don't do that, my decisions are terrible and I'm snappy with my team and my family life isn't great and I'm really low energy all the time. Sometimes you just got to hold the mirror up, Joshua, you know, and say, hey, do you know that, look at what's going on, man. Look at what's, what you're doing here. You're totally, you're at you're, your wit's end all the time. So, but it is, it is hard for them. And it's that thing of going, I'm just not going to deal with that fire. It's just going to have to burn. So then with, with, you know, a lot of our audience is in that, I think in that, that stage that you're talking about right now, you know, right. They, they've got a small team around them. They're looking to grow, but they're massive overwhelm there. So in order though, I mean, what, what kind of recommendations do you give your clients then in that stage of identifying what to say no to and getting really clear on maybe the three to five things to, to focus with on that time? You know, because I'm sure there's a lot of fear that they're experiencing. And also, you know, I mean, I've been there so many times where I've been told to slow down. I'm like, I can't like, you know, which was all BS, but it was the story I attached to at that time. But you probably genuinely felt that at the time as well. You know, like that whole thing of when people say that and I didn't believe burnout was a thing at some point in my life as well. But it is. I mean, hey, maybe it's just, maybe it doesn't exist when you're younger and it does when you start to get a bit older. I don't know. But <clears throat> certainly, like that decision, it's like your decision making ability will completely diminish. You'll start doing stupid things. You won't take care of your clients the way that you should be taking care of them. So the guys who are at that point, if you've got a, if you've got a team, um, Make sure that when you're building that, you're assembling it in the right way. So one of the, the one of the problems that happens at that um, traction point for entrepreneurs that I work with is that they've been assembling a team based on the cheapest hire. Do you know that it's been, I can't afford the A player yet. I can't afford the A player. But then there comes at a stage where it's like, you need an A player for two days a week. So sack off that one that you've got in for five days, or well, not sack them off, but like the next hire should be an A player for two days a week not five, and now you need to start delegating and devolving and giving stuff away. And it's also about identifying that in your people. You know, this sort of, there's a, a command and control element that creeps in. Because think about it, right? You've been going through that entrepreneurial journey. It's all on you. Everybody's been holding you up as that superstar because they want to be entrepreneurs, but they didn't really do it. And now you've got this whole, you know, this, um, this image gets reflected back on you that builds you up as well. So you've got, you know, and now I need to be a superstar all the time, right? Because everybody thinks I'm a superstar and all this stuff starts to seep into your subconscious. So you need to think about like, what is it that you're actually going to let go of? I talk about superpowers, which are these like innate abilities that we all have that we can take to world-class levels. And if you're an entrepreneur at that point, the only way that you're going to make it is by leveraging those. And the great thing about those is that they'll give you energy. Like you will love them and you'll start to operate. You learn faster. The science is all there about the brain chemistry that changes. You know, you learn faster. You are more productive. That's the way that you get to the world-class level. So in order to, in order to be able to give yourself that space to breathe, because you're still going to want to do work, it is about what is going to be delegated and really thinking about the A players that I have, uh, sorry, the, the, the people that I need next. Is it an A player that I'm going to be able to delegate to? looking across the four or five people, maybe up to 10 people that I have at the moment, who's the one that I believe can step up? And sometimes, do you know what? Who has just run their course? And they're, they might have worked out for me a year ago, a couple of years ago, but now we need to think about losing them, do you know? Because they're not actually going to help me to get up to that next level. And I don't mean that in a harsh way, because that person who's not going to help you get up, they're not really enjoying it either. And maybe they need to go into a job where they can do nine to five, get themselves in the easy street. So it's really thinking about the composition of that. What are the things that I really should be focusing my time and energy on? What can I be delegating? And how do I start to build a team 
that isn't just a, a traditional, you know, the next thing's a thousand, a uh, hundred grand higher. It doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I've, I've had the opportunity to interview several, you know, CEOs that, that are running billion dollar organizations. And when I've asked them and, and I mean, this is like the most common answer that I've gotten from them. Um, uh, not all of them have answered this way, but the most common when I've asked them like, what, what's been the hardest part about the journey? And the most common response is the people you start with aren't the people that you end with, you sure. know, right. And it could be buddies that they started these companies with and whatever, but they didn't level up and grow with this. And sometimes you just gotta, you, as you talked about, make those cuts and get those right people in the right seats. Yeah, the the co-founder thing's really tricky, man. Because when uh, there does, t it's very rare. It's, I have to say, it's a bit of an exceptional case, really, if we are that alignment goes right the way through the kind of stages that I'm taking them through. Because <laughs> that early stage of like this is all fun, and people feel that they've got um, they've got this real identity and like a two-person co-found startup thing. But then you need the guy, maybe they were the tech guy, right? But then you need a tech guy level 10. And the guy that co-founded is a tech guy level six, you know, and there isn't anything else for them to do. It's tough, man. That's really tough. But again, I would say that that's to do with the ambition and the, you know, the, the, will, the willingness to develop. Um, some people can actually, more people could make that journey if they, they push themselves at the, the same rate as the, you know, the person who's trying to lead that business uh, all the way. But yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one, man. But th look, those people are out there. In my experience, the big problem is that they don't believe they can let, they can cede control to some of their, their, um, those guys that came in. Some of them are not going to get you there, but there's more potential. If you've got five, there's probably two that are, you know, they're just not going to do it, right? Uh, there's probably one that you already think is a superstar. And those other two have got more than you realize, but your behavior as a leader is unintentionally stifling their growth because you're not, you're not giving them that test. You're not giving them that challenge. You're not having the honest conversations with them about, hey, I want to give you this opportunity for three, six months. You know, and if you can step up, then let's do it. And if you can't, I'll have to get somebody else, but I want to give you this opportunity. And to frame that in a way that's not like, um, you know, you're on the hook here. And if you don't step up in the next three months, you know, I'm going to destroy your life or you're going to be like this total failure. It's that honest conversation about you. I see something in you. Let's uh, let's test that over three, six months. That that doesn't happen enough at that inflection point. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say the, the, probably the hardest part of my entrepreneur journey is is coming to the conclusion and understanding of you know, because when we first start, we're solopreneurs, so we're doing everything. And typically like in real estate, okay, I was a great realtor, but then it became a thing where it didn't matter about how good of a realtor it was, I was, it was about how good of a leader I was. Sure, and it took sure. a long time, but I realized, man, I'm a shitty leader, you know, right? Um, and I, I mean, if I reflect back on it, I let go of so many good people and I failed them as a leader. Now they weren't getting the results I wanted at that point, but later years down the road, I realized I didn't give them the leadership that they needed to grow. So in that point, if, if uh, an entrepreneur that's listening to this maybe has somebody that they're thinking, ah, man, I don't know if they're an A player, or B player, you know, right? At what point do you have them take responsibility first as a leader to see how, you know, like what am I doing wrong as a leader to allow this person to grow and develop? And then how much time should we give that before then we can put them in those tests that you talked about? So, I mean, look, it's, it's a hard one to just go, here is exactly, you know, the, the time that you would do that because you have to go on that case by case. But getting people to self-identify about where do you think you are on this journey? You know, like, just have the, it's the, it's the authentic, the authentic, honest conversation about, so you're sitting there with that person going, where do you want to get to? Like, what is the potential that you've got? How do we change this environment? That really it's really up in your listening skills. There's something called deep listening. I can't remember who the, the I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head, but it's a really short ebook about like actually being present and listening to what's going on. As a leader, um, and certainly in the entrepreneurial world, they tend to be problem solvers, right? So the problem is then all on you. It's all on you to solve. 
if you want your people to take that ownership, it's the honest conversation to say, look, you know, what do you see as the potential in this business? What's the next step that you could do? Where do you want to use more of, of what you've got? I just don't think they have that. I think that there's a, a response, almost like a, a patriarchal responsibility, do you know, to take care of those people and I'll shape your destiny for you. And it's all down to me to identify and pull everything out. There's a really good um, model called the Alliance by Reid Hoffman, uh, who was the founder of LinkedIn. And he talks about the in Silicon Valley where it wasn't about it was really hard to maintain, to keep the talent, right? Because it wasn't about money. Everybody was offering the same kind of money. It wasn't the fact you had a table tennis, you know, and, and whatever, bean bags all over the place and, you know, Swedish massage going on, right? Because everybody had that. What made the difference in attracting and re retaining this talent was that when you come and work for us, we're not a family and we're not a big group of friends. What we are is allies. You know, we, and this is why the strategy and the mission and all that are so important. We're aligned to try and get to here. Here's the skills and the abilities that we're going to need to reach our next milestone. Where do you feel that you can step up and into one of those positions? Because I, I want to help you to do that if that's what you want to do. That's a really different conversation to, I'm going to work out what the project is for, for Dave in my shed, and then I'm going to take it to him and lay it on him. It's this whole cultural reframe about how you're actually approaching that. That's why all these things fit into each other. You need to know that strategy and have the clarity there so you can talk intelligently to your people. So you're not just, they're not just coming in going, what the hell is this business today, right? <laughs> because we're, we're taking some other opportunity. So it's about having the clarity there. It's about the clarity in your own head about here is where I'm really strong. Here is where I'm being honest with myself about what I'm, where my weaknesses are and what I might be doing wrong. And building that trust into your people. Some people are going to let you down, but there's a lot more of them that won't if you set that right, if you set the culture up right to do that in the relationship. And it's about being authentic. You are still the leader, but you are having much more authentic, deep listening conversations with them and setting up things like the alliance agreement to encourage them to take ownership. Now, before you have those conversations, because I can honestly say that I've never had those type of conversations, you know, right? Which I need to be, you know, right? It, it, as you say that, it all just clicks and it makes sense. Um, but the, the question that comes up to my mind, though, is do I need to have the answers before when I'm asking those deep level questions like that, the deep listening questions, as you mentioned, like, you know, when I'm asking, you know, the questions that you just framed, but it's do I need to know, hey, what would the right person in this position, how would they respond to that? Do I need to have clarity on those before I enter those conversations? No, I think there's, there's a key thing that goes on, right, when you're asking, when you're getting an engagement from your people around the, the what and the how. So what I mean by that is there are times where you go to your team and you say, we've got this problem and I don't know like what the answer is. So let's collectively try and find out what the answer to that problem is. Maybe there's a new market you're going into. Maybe it's a, a different way of doing customer retention or, or whatever that thing is, right? So there's a problem here. I don't know what the answer is. And the how is where you go to them and say, here is what I want us to do. You know, here is what that customer retention thing looks like. This is the, the vision. This is what good looks like. <coughs> how are we going to do that? Now, they're very, very different questions because if you go in with the, I know what the answer is. Sometimes what I see is, oh, I want to get my people engaged, but I already know the answer I want them to give me. That's just, that's an absolute disaster. You're just setting yourself up to fail there. The only time you should be, if you're being an authentic leader, the only time you should ask someone's opinion is if you actually care about it, not if it's, this is the answer. And there are times where you have to go, this is the answer and this is what needs to be done. This is not up for debate. I often talk about that like where, you know, where it is like a big strategic decision. There's some people's opinions that, well, you've got an opinion, but it's just not informed enough. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you don't understand that market well enough, so you can give me an opinion, you know, but you can't actually, it's not, it's not valid enough. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if you are, if you're going to them, you've got to care what their opinion is. So what, if we take that example I was talking about with the people is to say, 
here's strategically what it is that we're trying to achieve. This is the goal. I'd like you to step into it. Tell me how you would go about doing that. Because it might well be different to the way you're thinking. This is a whole point of having a team, right? Again, I'm, I'm such a guy for like books and frameworks, right? But there's a guy, Matthew Syed, who talks about cognitive diversity. That's the only diversity that matters. It doesn't matter what your religion and race and all of those, you know, like a, a diversity metric. I, I get what that is, but really what that brings is a cognitive diversity, these different lenses on the world. And if you trust your people and you want to become a leader and develop them, there are times where you have to give them permission to maybe try out one of those hows that's like, mm, that's not how I would do it because that's the only way you're going to increase the ownership. And there's definitely, there are times where I see this with entrepreneurs where they give that team member the what, the team member then defines the how, takes the ownership, because now it's on me and I feel I've got an identity and I'm, I want to make that happen. It changes the buy-in completely, but just you've got to let them do it their own way. So you need to think then about how much rope do I give them? So if it's the what in terms of, you know, we've got these million pound clients that we need to, to close and I'll just leave that with you and you can, you know, work out how you're going to do that, junior staff member. We're not talking about that, right? We're talking about here is something, a, a time frame that comes in much smaller, smaller goal. Okay, junior staff member, here's something I want you to take ownership of and explore. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a sliding scale. And I've, I've rambled a, a little bit there, Joshua, sorry. But it's that, it's that key distinction between the what and the how. That's what's really important there. Yeah, I love it, man. So powerful. And I, uh, you know, I remember several years ago, I'm reading this, this article about Andrew Carnegie. And, and it talks about a conversation that he was having with a good buddy of his from back in the day. And they meet up. And this is when he was Andrew Carnegie. And it was now the richest man in America. And you know, how do you impress him, right? So his friend was bragging about, he's the first one in the office, the last one out and all this. And Andrew looks at him, he's like, look, man, if you're, if you're doing all of that, he's like, you either need to, you're either really lazy or you're really <laughs> shitty at what you do. And he goes, I meet with, here's what I do. He's like, I meet with my people for two hours a day. I meet with the right people. Uh, we discuss the goals, where we're at in the goals. I give them my suggestions, which I thought was really powerful. He's not telling them, Yep. to do he's just giving them hey here's my suggestions on how to solve this problem sure. um, he goes then they go about their day of accomplishing the goals and i go and enjoy the rest of my day and 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 that totally changed my whole paradigm of business i'm like i'm doing this all wrong i'm pulling all nighters i'm you know whatever and i'm not leading that way and everything that you're saying it's just when you study the greatest leaders of our time whether they're here today or or we're past great leaders they all operated in that way and it just, you know, but it's for some reason, as small business owners, we think our situation is different. Yeah. And, and we think um, it is, it's all on us. The thing is as well, so if you look at that traction point that I'm talking about, the person who's coming in, typically, you know, I was talking about when you can get that A player, but typically the person coming in is not as good as at the, doing the thing as you were as the entrepreneur. So if you were doing, when you're that solopreneur and you were doing five things, your first hire comes in. And maybe they are as good as you, right? And now you've got those four things. Your next hire is not as good as you at that thing because you can't afford the person that is as good as you. So then you find that really hard to let go of. And you, you get frustrated because, you know, it's tomorrow they aren't as good as the way that you were doing it. So then you end up going back in and taking control of that. And, but you need to understand all the stuff that's going on in your subconscious. You know that it's flowing into your head that make the conscious choice. So if you're saying that you are going to give that person, whatever it is, say it's like three months, and the clarity on those targets and goals and the expectations and setting that alliance agreement, this is how I'd like you to develop. How do you see it? What is it that you want to do? Making more conscious decisions around that type of stuff. This, what I do with my guys really is like raising the awareness of, here's the things that are actually going on. You're on autopilot. Like you're going in and you're you don't see how much control you're trying to exert over that. You think you're doing the right thing, right? Like Carnegie going, he could probably have gone in and gone, do you know what you need to do is this? But who's got the ownership then? You know, who's, who takes the ownership? How do you feel that you've got any identity in the company if you're just the vehicle to carry out somebody else's bidding? Like these are key shifts in leadership. So I, th I think that's a really great point you raised there around, um, this is my suggestion. Tell me what you've got first, what you plan to do. Here's a suggestion. 
Although, <laughs> although I'd be pretty nervous about like Andrew Carnegie giving me a suggestion in that TV and right <laughs> and me not doing it. Uh, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, th- thanks for that, mate. Uh, yeah, nice one. Um, yeah, but it, but it's the mentality of that. It's your intention, right? So that's the, that's what that's all about. Yeah, love it. And then you said something a moment ago about awareness of what's happening subconsciously, those those thoughts, you know, sure. right? And, you know, it does, it can screw us up if, if we're not careful. And, and I, you know, I didn't have any awareness of this until I started doing some spiritual work, you know, yeah. right? Because you have that voice and you think that voice is you, but then it's like, well, if you're talking, who's listening, you know? And, sure, right. Sure. And all this, can, can you kind of explain, you know, what you mean by that, of having awareness of, of you know, what the subconscious is saying? Sure. So, like, your mindset is, is a prism, right? Is, there is no, you know, to get a, a little philosophical here, like there, there is no objective world. There is only the subjective world. There's only your interpretation of that. And it is very different for everybody. The, the, the negative voice is an interesting one. It, the, the science shows that it lives in the front of your head, right? So the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is an area that lights up and it's to do typically with self-monitoring and self-regulation. Now, the positive side of that is that it's keeping an eye on what you're doing. So you don't like walk into traffic. Or if you are just about to do something, you know, fundamentally stupid, it's your your sort of self-checking system. But when it goes into that overdrive and it starts criticizing you, it's the subconscious drivers that are doing that, right? So if you think that in order for you to be worthy, in order for you to be loved and accepted in the world and respected, which is really at the core of what all human beings need. People can say they don't need that. Okay, unless, maybe you're a, a psychopath, right? Or a sociopath. But basically people need that. You know, they love the respect, the acceptance, to feel they've got a place in the world. Now, what drives your interpretation of that is very different. So I'm really direct. I'm really intense. I'm not that... I don't care about having the difficult conversations because it's so important for me that we make progress. You know, this is just a driver that's within me. But for some other people then, well, and I'll tell you what what will fire up my inner critic is where I feel I'm not being smart. You know, where I, because that's what I think like worthy and everything else is for me, right? It's about being a smart guy, a guy who knows stuff, a guy who's going to help like humanity make this progress. So if I feel I'm not doing that, inner critic goes crazy. So if I have got a bit of content that I'm not happy with, I'll perfectionize over it, I'll hang on to it. But it's only like understanding all those kind of layers of, do you know, see in this situation, Joe, this, this happens to you and you know that you do it. What's the control mechanism for that? So sometimes for me, that's like making sure I've got a tight deadline, making sure when that is flaring up that I have that conversation with somebody. For other people, their subconscious, that self-identity is based on being a really nice person because you have this massively strong empathy with people. You know, the people that are those amazing networkers that can remember everybody's name and their kids' birthdays and all that. I can barely remember your name, right? I'll be the guy that remembers what it is that you do and is it going to advance humanity's cause? I don't remember Nikki's little Nikki's birthday, right? Or that she was in some nativity play. I'm just not going to remember that. But you get people who are, and it's such a powerful thing, that empath thing. But then that starts to shape what their version of worthy is. So when they feel they're crossing the line or they are, they might potentially upset somebody, bang, that inner critic comes on as well. And the, the whole thing about, we talked about sort of the progression and people leveling up, that imposter thing, I'm going to lose respect, you know? So I'm going to try and step up. I'm going to make a mistake, bang. That dorsolateral prefrontal cortex inner critic kicks in and it'll say, no, no, don't do that. Oh, no, we, need, we want to be safe. It's trying to keep you safe all the time. What is interesting about that, and I'll stop talking in a second, what is interesting about that is that when you use your superpowers, so when you're in this flow state, when you're using your key abilities, that area shuts down. This is why when you're doing something that you feel totally connected to in the moment, you don't get that voice of doubt. So when I'm in a strategy session, because I love strategy, right? I'm a big picture relationships thing. When I'm in that strategy session, there is no second guessing of myself. Yes, I'm thinking about what's the best way to do it, but there's nothing going, no, this is not right, Joe. You need to stop doing this. You need to back down. And that's not happening because that part of your brain shuts down. It's, it's like your brain saying, see if you do the things that you love and you're amazing at, I, I'll help you out. You know, I'll give you the, the chemicals that you need. I'll shut down the bits that are unhelpful. 
this is why it's so important for these entrepreneurial leaders, well, for everybody, man, but, you know, for entrepreneurial leaders to understand where that flow is and to build those people around them. Because everybody, I've never met anyone who doesn't have that voice of doubt. It was a nice thing, actually, when um, that was introduced to me and then I've started to look at it and I know it's a biological thing and it doesn't mean that I'm crazy because everybody's got it and it's evolutionary. It's there for the right reasons, but it's how you dialogue effectively with it and how you, how you do the things that are aligned with your flow, because then it doesn't impact you as much. Would you say that that is also a good tool to help you identify your flow state and then where you're in flow and your strengths is when that, like, what is like just somehow noting and taking note of the work that you're doing where that inner voice isn't just going a million miles an hour. <laughs> like if you look at it, I mean, people, people can look up um, flow state cause it, you know, it's like anything, man. It just depends how deep people want to go into it, right? But if you look at three core components in terms of energy, focus, and time distortion. So if, you, if people are to look back over that last couple of weeks or month or whatever, I mean, really, it should be, you know, a day. You should be doing sound and flow in a day, right? But week or month and go, when am I actually energized? When do I feel completely focused on that moment? So much so that the rest of the world just disappears. Now, I talked about those empath people before. You know, those guys who are at the, that networking event, and I don't, know if this is, I don't know if this is you or not, right, but you, you'll have seen people like this. They are so engaged in that conversation that, that is, that's their world, you know, for that five or six minutes. They're paying you so much attention, so much focus. I don't have that because when I'm in conversation, I tend to be thinking about, you know, how, how are we at, because I'm so functional. Like, how do we help each other what how does this you know how's this dynamic going to work is this a good use of your time and my time not not for for this type of thing i mean like you know when you're doing that kind of sussing people out at a networking event my sus factor's on high not because i think that you know i'm some guy oh, you know i'm only going to talk to you if you're really useful to my life i'm thinking about it as a two-way thing but they are totally in that moment it's total focus on it i get it in a strategy session you know, when, when do you feel that? When do you feel like focused, energized, and that time distorts? When does it happen for you? Um, building systems. Like I love developing back-end systems, automation. Or you know, I love strategy. Like when you're saying that, that conversation, like give me a marker and a whiteboard. <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, eight hours will feel like it's only been 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. I'm a systems guy. I'm laughing there because I'm a systems guy as well. Like, I'm always looking for and what is the system behind this. It's like my program. So my programs are based on looking at your head, not just let's get, you know. The problem with mindset is sometimes it's confused as being a, a yoga pose on Instagram, you know, with somebody saying, hey, go live your best life, right? It's really, it's, it annoys me a lot because it feels that it's, it's just diluted what mindset is, man. Do you know, like, Mindset is everything. We are all wired differently. The, the reason that we end up not solving all the world's problems like that, like tomorrow, is because we underappreciate what we've got. We get conditioned as we go through school to be, this is what good looks like. You know, that you get these scores and these tests, that you're this amount of cool, you know, and that you've got this jacket or whatever. Do you know, like it's such a twisted system to actually help people understand what they're supposed to do. And then you'll go into a job, which you've, you know, you've just taken it because it's vaguely aligned to something you might be interested in and it pays money. And then if you don't, if you're not mindful, that's it. Like that's your life and you're locked into that, that terrible situation, you know. It's this real appreciation of what mindset is. When you talk about that systems thinker, you know, there must be times where you've been with people that can't believe what you can do. Like they can't believe that you can take th these sort of different components and put them into something that makes sense or explain back to them, like, this is what's going on. It's that's such a cool superpower. I mean, have you ever had that when you're working with people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, just because I coach a lot as well. And, and, and you know, the, I didn't know it when I started my entrepreneur journey that this was going to be my superpower either. It became solving one of my problems. I would have never guessed it would be it, but you know, fast forward 14, 15 years later. I mean, it's like, to me, heaven is like sitting behind my computer for 14 hours, building out, you know, campaigns and infusion software, whatever it may be, you know, right? Um, yeah, yeah all, all the time. 
Yeah, and it's not <laughs> to your your point where I see you know I have friends and and uh, uh, acquaintances whatever that are those networkers like in the disc test I'm an, a ten on the eye so I'm very introverted where they right. can just work the room I've never seen magic like that where I'm just like yeah. how, how you do that you know. And and if you're if you're thinking about those you know your listeners and then how they're going to step up and like what their next step is, the key thing, man, is like lean into who you are. That is scary. Um, and if you know if you're a coach, I, I don't know, I don't know, like you know, I don't know how expensive your program is or like how that works, but it is about find yourself a coach. You know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're obviously connected in some way to Joshua, right? So how are you? How are you going to lean into that? Like, how are you going to get some support to do it and the courage to do it? Because other people, you need to be very mindful of who you're around. It's hard for me to accept that people don't want to find a bit of, you know, we talked about like purpose and this, the semantics around that, right? But this identity and this direction and this meaning and, you know, living, living that life, you know, finding out the true identity. When you have that moment, there'll be people around you that will pull you down because they want that too, but they are too afraid to do it. And it makes, it protects their psyche by, some, by watching other people not be able to do that or to pull them, you know, no, stay, stay in this space because it means I don't have to justify to myself why I'm not doing it. So you need to get yourself, if you get to that point where you're like, I want to level up, that whole thing about you're the average of the five people you spend time with is really, it's very true. <clears throat> but you do, you do also tend to need that person as a coach who is just, whose sole purpose is to help you to develop that courage to keep going and to take that next step. So fully leaning into your authenticity is the biggest thing that I can say. And again, sometimes that can fit sound a little bit cliched, and, but that's what I've been doing for myself over the last sort of six really, really most intensely over the last six months. You know, the, all these pivots towards that, um, towards this goal. And then when I, I found my niche, it still took time to really lean into it. <clears throat> you know, to really put myself out there and say, this is who I am, this is what I stand for. It is mindset. If you don't buy into mindset, I'm not your guy. If you're not a, an entrepreneur who puts impact above money, and I don't mean like solving the world's hunger problems. I mean like creating an impact on the world becoming that version of you, not just, I don't work with mercenaries, I find them incredibly boring and their ethics are twisted, right? So you have to buy into those things, but fully leaning into your identity is frightening, but so, so powerful. Um, and that's how you'll find that you'll be in that flow state more often. Yeah, love it. So yeah, and, and you, you talk about my coaching program, you know, it's more of a training program than a, than a coaching program, if you will. And it's, how to tactically and strategically build a real estate business. So it isn't working on the, you know, the stuff that you just talked about, you know, right. right. Of, you know, hopefully people that jump into my program know that this is where they want to be. And, but man, when you talk about finding your authentic self, because we are so mechanically wired to the domestication of just our lives. It's like, sometimes I wonder if, is any thought I have, truly original you know right or is it just based off of the of, of all this conditioning um with the coaching that you do i mean is this you know is this a part of your program or or you know because man I, I did i would love to go deeper in just getting clear on that it's been a lot of work i've been trying to be more intentional with doing for the first time in my life over like last year to six months sounds you know um but man it's 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 it, there's a lot to it, you know, right? Um, so when it comes to that, man, is is that part of the work that you do? Yeah, so look, I don't, um, there have been times, not so much of the core clients, when I worked with the entrepreneurial organization, there were times where something would surface that was it like a counseling issue. Was, was you know, that, that relationship that you had or your, your mother dying or, or whatever that was. Like, I, I, we've uncovered that but now you need the person that's actually going to solve that problem for you, you know? But that's the level of the nerve that I want to get to. Because if you look at your subconscious, it's like this tightly coiled wire. And it's so tightly coiled that you are taking loads of stuff for granted. And it's only through the behaviors. It's, it's that this mismatch between this is what I say I want and this is what I'm actually doing. And it takes a coach to hold that mirror up 
And then it's the depth of going, what is all the thing? What are the things that are actually driving you to act in that way? And because I, because I am so, because I'm the systems thinker, because I like to drill down, and because my clients have given me permission to do that, like that's what they're signing up for. That we are going to go to that depth. It's it's a real eye opener for them at, at times. Do you know that this? And it happens to me. It happens to me as well. Like even so, if you look at uh, my thing, I'd always thought about um, where is where is this sort of this this smart and perfection? Like where the hell does that come from? Because when I was growing up, um, I went to a small school, right? But th this is basically what comes out of that. I went. I grew up. I went to a small school, and it was quite easy to be top of the class. Like there were twelve people in my class, so I was the smartest in the class, and I liked that. You know, I like that. That then starts to confer that on my identity. My dad was smart. I never felt that love was conditional there, but he was a smart dude. Do you know, I remember just growing up thinking, like, what a guy. And he could he, he could do, in my eyes, the guy could do almost anything, right? Awesome. And love was not conditional on it. But this, again, puts another layer on, you have to be smart. This is what's going to fire up your inner critic. Like, understanding where those drivers are coming from and what they mean for me gives me an awareness where I can start to tackle that and go, that's flaring up. Here's why. This is what I do about it. Okay, bang, I can go and do the next thing and keep pushing through the levels. You're never going to, when you say about, like, am I ever having an original thought or are any of these thoughts actually mine? So it's an interesting question because like we are social creatures, right? We do get influenced by what's around us. But then it's about where is it I want to get to and what is it that might be a belief system that is impacting me from doing that? Like what stops me from sitting at the top table? Even my, my position around, I'm not really listening to market demand, right? I'm looking at what is going on out there, like what I see and having trust in what I've seen and what I've known and the experience that I've built up to go, this is the problem. I want the, pro I want the program for this type of entrepreneur, which is a small niche, who want to do this type of thing, who want to be asked these types of questions to do that. And anybody outside of that, I don't want to work with them. So it's having the confidence to lean into that. Um, and it is about the guys that I'm working with. You have to know yourself at that deeper level or you won't be able to do that thing. That's my principle. So my guys believe in that too. And that's why you've got to go to that depth. So would you say though, if, if one of our listeners is, is listening to this and, and like, man, I, I'm not there yet where... I'm, I have that understanding, but I want to be there and they have an open mind to it. Is that sure. still somebody that would be right for your program? So what, what I'm doing with that to help people to identify is that there is an online program that's coming out in January, which will be 10 modules. And that is just work through this stuff. And if you like what I've got to say, then let's look at the next step. Because I've made the mistake before of taking people for what, what is effectively, you know, level two there. Um, and it's been good, but it's not been a perfect match. You know, and I feel I've helped them, but was I absolutely the right guy? And that, that's a big question for me as well as a coach. You know, I, I want to, I don't want your money. Well, I, well I, you know, <laughs> I want you to pay me with the service, right? But it's, it's not about that. Like the, the match has to be right. Because some, for some clients, when you're coached, there are clients that if you were to pay me a million dollars a month, I still don't want to work with you because we're not getting anywhere. And me taking your money makes me complicit in the lie that you're telling yourself about your progress, right? So it's good to be the right person. But the, the whole thing about the 10 modules and the, the way that's come about is to go, here is a taste of that. Like our, our worldviews have to overlap to some extent. So here is a low-risk way for you to, to taste that um, and then see if you're ready to go up to the next one. And then there's like a level three, which is, you know, where, where we are super advanced, where our, our relationship is is such that there's just no, everything's like fully authentic, you know? Every thought that's going through, there's no, there's no subtext. It's just, this is what's going on between us. That's, oh, that's massive, mate. See, when you have those types of relationships where there is no subtext, where it is just human to human, this is what's going on. Um, I can say anything to you. You can say anything to me. And we're all focused on the same goal. That's huge, man. Um, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's that's the path. Light touch. Do you like this worldview? Let's explore it face-to-face -face a bit more. 
and then, okay, let's go all the way. And that's not right for everybody. That's why I've structured it in the way that I have. Yeah, love it, man. So, Joe, where, where's the best place if, if – any but whatever level the program is, if they want to learn more about them, if they want to, you know, check out what's included, or maybe just like I'm ready to jump into the course right now. Like, where's the <laughs> best place for those uh, to go do that at? So the the online course is going to be released in January. Um, it's something that's being developed at the moment, so they can look at everything on the website effectively. MindsetExperts.co.uk. Um, there are people that can be ready for level two and I would have a conversation with them, right? But they would have to be. Like when we have the chat, it would have to be, yeah, you're, you're ready to sharpen that up. And it is, just to be clear, it is designed for those guys who are like, I'm at that cusp of the next level. So I've got this operational team. I do want to create this massive impact in the world and I want to step up as an entrepreneurial leader and I feel I'm chasing my tail. I don't know how to do it. And I want to focus on me, like how I am going to do it. Um, but yeah, sorry, mindsetexperts.co.uk. And on LinkedIn, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. And I'm not as hard, there, there's no hard sales pitch here, man. Like I said, we've got to be right for each other or nobody wins. So I'm not, I'm not, there's no, <laughs> there's no cunning subliminal tactic going on, you know. It's human to human. If you've got this problem, and I'm a good jigsaw puzzle fit for you, then let's do it. Let's do it because the world needs people at their potential. Yeah, love it. Powerful stuff. And those watching and listening will make it super easy. And you have that, that link right below. So wherever you're at, that right below where you can go check out all Joe's stuff. Um, and as always, I don't end the podcast with this, but information without implementation is truly just the start of delusion. Information isn't power. It's taking that information and taking action on it, which gives you the power to create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Joe shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys today. Make sure that you take something that you learn and again, take immediate action on it so you can create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Joe, this has been amazing, man. I truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day of year. This has been great. Yeah, I've loved it too, man. It's been great talking to you. It's always great to talk to somebody who shares, you know, that that desire to improve. So that's, that's awesome, man. I've really enjoyed it too. Thank you very much. Yeah, huge honor, my friend. All right, you guys, thank you for watching. Listen, we'll see you next time. Peace.